Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to today's webinar hosted by the TEFL Academy. My name is Luan and I am from Cape Town, South Africa. And it would be wonderful to hear where you are today, where you're watching from. So please say hi in the chat. Tell us your name and where you are. Um, yeah, it would be lovely to know who's watching. Just a bit about me, if you haven't seen any of these webinars before. So as mentioned, my name is Luan and I've been a teacher for over 13 long years. Not that long, considering it is a wonderful profession. I wouldn't give it up for anything. So it's been great. Um, yeah, I've taught students from all over the world, from all walks of life, all ages, all levels. It's been quite exciting and I'm really excited to be part of your journey. It's always amazing to meet new teachers and to hear about all these amazing experiences that you'll be having. So I will mention that today's webinar is on a very, very particular topic, but that we will answer questions at the end of the presentation section of the webinar. So hold on to those questions, jot them down, and later on when I do open up Q&A, of course you're more than welcome to post your questions in the chat function, and I will of course address as many of those as possible. So I see all those names coming in uh, from Jamaica. We have Carol from Jamaica. Um, we also have people from South Africa, welcome, from India, uh, Turkey, you're all really, really welcome. I'm very excited to have you here today. So today's webinar, as mentioned, is really, really interesting. We will be covering quite a lot and you will most likely have questions at the end. So as mentioned, if you have questions later on, you, I'm going to invite you to type them into the chat. If you don't have any questions today, but you think of something a little bit later on, of course, you can ask us on Tutor Support, where we will be more than happy to assist you. So all those names have come in. Wonderful to see you all here today. So let's get started. Right. So today's webinar is all about creating and adapting teaching resources. So as teachers, we're always adding to our skill set. We always want to get better. But in addition to that, we're also we, we grow a portfolio, a collection of materials that we use and we recycle and we adapt and we add to and we improve over the years. Every teacher has a starter pack that just keeps growing and growing and growing with all sorts of wonderful resources. So as teachers, we create some of those resources, we adapt, we find things on the internet, we find things in books, and we adapt those resources so that they actually suit what we're doing in our classes and with a particular group of students. So I guess the questions that we very often ask ourselves is when when thinking about creating or adapting materials is do I search for suitable suitable materials say for example on the internet do I create my own materials um, do I re recycle some existing stuff that I've got already or existing materials that are out there it is tempting to use other people's resources and then adapt them for your own classroom but sometimes this actually takes longer than just creating something yourself. And how wonderful it must feel to create something and know that you've, you've, you've created that specifically. You've tailor-made that piece of material specifically for that class, for that um, age group, for that level. It is a great feeling. But of course, all these things, they do take a lot of work. So there are a few things that we need to consider. Um, when you are creating materials, think about how much you know about the subject. Now, of course, it is very, very important that when you are about to teach anything, when you're about to create materials, you need to know that subject inside and out. And that is all done in your preparation time as a teacher. You know, very often we walk into the classroom, we teach a lesson, we walk out. But most of our time, our investment goes into preparation. And that's part of it all. How much do we know about the subject? The next point that you need to consider is what do your students need to learn? So, of course, it's tempting to, to add um, lots and lots of 
uh, piece bits and pieces to our materials. But at the end of the day, what is it that they need to walk away from? What are the aims of that lesson? And do they relate to what is in the material that either you're creating or you are sourcing from another resource? Also, think about a student survey. Very often we do a student survey or needs analysis of some kind, um, but the survey is something quite basic where you can get to know your students' interests, their needs, what they like, what they don't like, and students are so diverse. It's amazing when you walk into a classroom, you just have such a variety of personalities and likes and dislikes. So I find that doing some kind of survey beforehand is so useful. It just gives me that information that I need um, to use when creating these new materials for my students. And then also teachers, think about the resources you already have, because very often what we have is quite useful and we can simply adapt or, you know, glam it up a little bit for another lesson. But think about what you already have in that resource pack. Another thing to consider, and this is probably for me personally, one of the most important things is the language level of your class. Make sure, you know, in other webinars and in our course content, we're always talking about grading your language, right? In other words, using vocabulary and grammar when speaking to your students that is at or below their level because they need to understand you, right? So the same applies when you create materials. Is the language graded in your materials? Are they going to see tenses on that um, PowerPoint presentation that you've made that they haven't learned yet? Are they going to see vocabulary in the instructions um, that they've not learned yet? So you do need to think about the language level of your class and that your materials are not really giving them um, you know, anything higher than what they're used to and what they already know. And then your demographics. So now here you've got to think about the age of your students and this is so important. Very often we tend to think well students are very low level so we create very babyish material for them with all these cutesy cartoon like pictures. Um, you need to think about the age of your students. How old are they? If they're adults, choose adult appropriate um, content and imagery, colouring, that sort of thing. Also think about culture. Where are you in the world and who's going to see these materials? That's another thing to take into consideration. And then the gender in your class. That might be a factor, it might not, but see what's going on before you create these materials. Some teachers create a needs analysis. And a needs analysis is something that you can get your students to fill in um, and they answer a variety of questions. And at the end of the day, what you've got there is just a pot full of information with what topics your students would be com comfortable with, what would engage them, what would intrigue them. And I think it's an amazing opportunity to really tailor have those lessons tailor-made um, to your students' needs and their interests, because I think that from the, from the minute you start that lesson, they'll be engaged, they'll be interested. So that's the needs analysis. Do check in our course content, what we say about that, how we tell you to structure the questions. It's all there, but it is something ever so useful to bring into your class so that you can actually um, interest your students with your content and also your materials. Right, so another thing that you've got to consider when sourcing or creating materials in the classroom is, am I creating these materials for an online class like this one, or am I creating these materials for a face-to-face -face class? Um, will everything be displayed on a screen? Will these activities or worksheets or images, will they be passed around? Are they, do they have to be tangible, tactile things, or is it, would it be something that I can display on screen? So you've got to really think about what scenario you're creating this for. And then also think about copyright, duplicating materials, check for creative uh, commons resources and check what the usage rights are. Of course, I'm not going to get into too much detail here because there are just so many rules and regulations out there. So what I can say is do your homework here. Check on Google, ask questions, check the course content. There is lots of information around this. So do check what the rights are, what your rights are to use that piece of material or that image um, or that bit of text. Right. 
Also, we have in English authentic, semi-authentic, and then of course course book um, related content. So when you have um, authentic materials versus semi-authentic, authentic materials would be anything that is not created for English learning purposes. This is something very, very important to get yourselves familiar with, right? So authentic materials are things that you and I would just pick up or click on and read for information, for entertainment, whatever the reason may be, it is something that is not being created for an English learning environment. So anything from those English learning sites, songs with vocabulary in it to learn English, um, you know, text that has been specifically graded for a particular level that would not fall part of authentic materials. Authentic materials would be your um, menus, your um, news articles, your magazine articles. Um, yes, the lyrics of a song. I, I tend to use that only in very particular situations. But yes, those would be authentic materials. We are semi-authentic or course book or education materials, well, those have been specifically maneuvered, manipulated, graded, or even created for English learning purposes. So before you embark on your journey of selecting materials, do make sure that you're aware of the difference between authentic and semi-authentic materials. Right. And then also, cost and time management. Teachers are busy people right? And we have to spend lots of money on this, that, and the other. So the cheaper or the freer these activities and, and materials are, the better, particularly when you're a new teacher. Make sure that the site that you're going on doesn't require some kind of subscription fee. Um, make sure that the imagery you're using, that it's for free. Make sure that it's more of an exchange of information on a teacher's site rather than having to buy bits of information. So do use, as far as you can, what is freely available out there. As I mentioned, as new teachers, a lot of us are just starting in our careers. We don't have tons of money to spend on these things. So use, check what's free and use what's freely available out there. It really, really helps. All right. So we're still on things that we need to consider when looking at or creating materials. So yes, we've got to make sure that our materials are really, really engaging. Um, students need to be intrigued. They need to be um, involved. It needs to be something interactive. So you've got to check, uh, can you use programs like Teacher Made or interactive sites if the students have access to the internet. See what your options are as far as you can. And then also the use of realia. So if, for those of you who do not know what realia is, realia is, would include anything um, real that you can bring into the classroom in order to um, explain meaning. So if someone says, right, for example, um, I don't know what a mouse is, a computer mouse. Bringing one in, showing them, that would be realia. Um, if the lesson is about fruit vocabulary, bring some fruit in. If the lesson is about utensils that we find in the kitchen, bring a cup, bring a saucer. That would be realia. So check that you're able to use it. Um, how easy it is to maybe bring those things in because anything that, you know, isn't text bound really engages your learners and gets them interested in what's going on in the front of the class. And then also, is there a technology required for the materials that you're wanting to use? Does the school have access to technology? If so, what to what extent? What technology? do they have access to? Um, is this technology user-friendly in the classroom? Is it always available? Is it reliable? Those are all things to consider when choosing material. What sort of technology do I need? As a teacher, am I tech savvy? Um, would my students be able to help me if I don't know what's going on? So quite a few questions to ask there. But once you've got those things ironed out, it is quite fun to use technology in the classroom. And then also, the last point on the slide is to think about the kind of materials. Are they going to be printed? Are they going to be online? Um, 
Are they going to be interactive? Would students be able to do them on the spot? Would you be able to check answers immediately? Are they going to be visuals that you're going to bring into the classroom, media resources? There is so much you can use. But I think that there are quite a few questions to ask yourself before you bring these things into the classroom. Right. So right now we're going to be taking a look at different kinds of resources. Right. So let's look at printed first. So the example out there of printed resources would be your worksheets, maybe newspapers, magazines. Um, these would be texts that you'll be able to print out or find. Um, in a print format, right? And then also online or interactive activities like your interactive worksheets, um, pronunciation lessons. I like using these in particular in my online lessons because I'm able to send the student the link to the activity um, and we're able to do the activity together on the spot or I'm able to display the activity and as soon as he or she chooses an answer I can select that answer and we can check if it's right together so those would be some of those interactive worksheets that you can do and then like I said those pronunciation lessons where you can listen to the sounds immediately those, those are quite useful also and then as we mentioned earlier visuals um, examples would be pictures or photos or artwork, maybe done by yourself, maybe done by someone else. But also, again, I find personally that visuals in the classroom really engage my learners. Very often I would put a, a photo up before they've walked in. And the photo would maybe relate to the context of my lesson. So maybe if my lesson is about what I did on the weekend, um, teaching them a past tense of some kind. I would just put a picture up of maybe having a barbecue with friends or playing a game with friends, walking my dog. And then they'd walk in and say, teacher, what is this? And I would say, well, that's my weekend. Let's have a look. And as they walk in, immediately they're engaged. They're interested. They want to know, where were you? <laughs> what were you doing? So with visuals, I find that they just do so much for me. So I find that this is one particular avenue that I keep exploring as a teacher um, in relation to what, what, what resources and what activities I can bring into my, my lessons. Right. And then also, as we mentioned earlier, your media resources. So think about your blogs. Think about your YouTube videos, your movie clips, your songs, your podcasts. But remember to have a backup plan in case like a paper worksheet in case the Internet fails you. That happens here from from time to time where I am. And we always have to have a backup plan. I suggest you do the same. Just have something tangible, something tactile that your students can work with just in case technology or Internet fails you. Right. So we're moving on. And the very next thing that we are going to look at is using online resources. Now, a lot of you are thinking, wow, well, it's a no brainer to use online resources in the classroom. And I would say you're absolutely right. But with that comes a lot of responsibility and also preparation. So you've got to select that website very, very carefully. Accurate content is essential and look for well-known trusted websites like the British Council, for example. Also check that the online resources that you're looking at are suitable for your class. Check the content, check the language grading, make sure that there isn't anything offensive um, watch if it's a video you found watch it from start to finish to make sure that it is in fact suitable and then also as mentioned earlier make sure that you're legally um, allowed to use it so check the copyright check the creative commons um, check what's allowed and what's not allowed and then also yes hidden costs do check um, if you have lifetime access or a temporary access um, don't put any um, ATM or card details in because they might start charging you. If anything needs your ATM card number or your PIN number or anything like that, I would say steer away unless it is a reputable site and you're actually willing to start paying for the service at a later stage. If you're not, then do check that it is freely available and that you're not expected to start paying for anything at any time in the future. All right, so we're still on using online resources. 
Right, so also interactive sites very often have exercises and these exercises are graded. So, um, you know, you'll be able to find the answers immediately or you click on check and there the answers are. But also be, be aware that if there are no answers automatically provide a, provided on the site, that you would need to work out the answers. And this can very, very often be quite time consuming. So I'm a teacher and I'm constantly busy. I know you are too. So do be aware that if you do use sites like these where you actually have to figure out the answers for yourself, I mean, that's great. But there are sites out there with the answers available immediately and you and your students can actually check them together, right? And then also classroom management. Um, can your students get easily distracted um, while they're on the sites? Um, do they have access to other sites? If they're on a particular site, is there the option to go onto another website while they're reading or looking at what you're wanting them to look at? Um, can they access other sites? Can they go off topic by clicking on a link on the website, opening up ads? So just check that what you have them working with is limited to specifically what you're using as materials in the classroom. And then also check broken links. Um, they are quite problematic. You know, the minute you start using resources like these, yes, they might be available for a little while. And then a couple of months later, that link is broken or the site is no longer active. That might be a problem. So as a teacher, if you've got this portfolio of resources, of materials, do check on those links quite regularly. And then also keep a list of those links um, for later use. Teachers like collecting stuff because we often recycle, um, you know, useful sites, useful exercises on sites. I know that I'm still using um, language placement tests that I discovered in 2000 and I don't want to tell you. So do save those. But like I said, do check on them quite regularly because, of course, sites do become invalid at some point. And then also, as mentioned, have a backup plan. If your power supply fails, if there is some kind of power outage or internet is down, have a backup plan. What can you use for the rest of the lesson? And you actually do need to have something concrete for the rest of the lesson because the power might, might be out for an hour or longer or three or four hours like you're in South Africa sometimes. So do make sure that you've got a backup plan. Preparation is key here. All right. So now we're going to be taking a look at using and adapting authentic materials. We're going to look at the steps involved just to give our students the absolute best experience and also to make your life a bit easier, teachers. Right. So the very first step when using or adapting um, materials would be have an aim. What will your students know or be able to do by the end of this lesson? So that's the first thing you've got to have in mind when either sourcing or creating materials. The very next step is select a theme, a context and specific situation. So if students are learning a past tense, you know, have a context like my last weekend. If they're learning a future tense, you can simply adapt that to the next weekend and look for pictures and interesting materials that are related to that. Um, you know, so there's a lot you can do around context, but it's key. It's necessary to pull your students in and keep them engaged. Right. Step three is to select appropriate resources suitable for your class, for the aim, for the objectives. Make sure that the resources are suitable to show your students at whatever age they are, whatever background, we spoke about culture, all those things earlier, that would be an important thing to consider too. And then step four, does the resource need to be adapted? So sometimes you find the world's most amazing resource and you think, wow, this just really goes with what I'm going to be teaching, I want to use this. But check, is the level of the resource okay or do you have to bring it down a little bit? Um, some of the vocabulary pieces that you're teaching are maybe not in there, so you might have to boost that with a couple of sentences. Um, or maybe there are extra words in the resource that your students won't know, so you'll have to adapt. So there are a few things to consider in terms of 
um, adaptations that you'd have to make to the resource because often we stumble across something it seems absolutely perfect but we do need to maybe tweak or revise it a little bit before using it in our lessons all right and then so we also need to consider a few more things so much to consider today but so fun once you get to know how to use and how to adapt um, external resources in the classroom right so as with existing resources you also need to consider um, demographics you also need to consider aims and objectives um, maybe an assessment you also need to consider the topic the skill um, what what is it that you want them to cover? What is it that you want them to practice in the lesson? And then yes, also uh, language grading and safety considerations. So all of these things are important to consider when creating your own resources, right? So existing resources, there are lots to consider, but with creating your own, again, demographics, the aims and object objectives of your lesson, what is the topic, what is the skill that you want them to practice, the language grading, if you're writing your own material, if you're sourcing your own material, if you're creating and putting together your own material, language grading for me is so important. And then safety considerations, yes, if it's a game, if it's something that gets your students moving about a little bit, is it all safe or do you need to adapt it somewhat in the classroom? So we're still on creating your own resources. And um, yes, another thing to remember is the whole authentic versus created resources. So when you've created maybe a story in the class or you have created um, something very particular for your students, that would no longer be authentic. Remember, authentic is something you just pick up outside and it's not specifically created or revised for an English lesson. So if you're making your own resources, if you are giving them a story, a narrative, but you've actually created that, it's not authentic. Doesn't make it bad, makes it fantastic, but it's just to show you that there is a clear difference between authentic versus created resources. See what works for your class. You might have a very low level class, so it's difficult to find something authentic for them. You might have a very high level class where it's quite easy to pick up something out of the local newspaper and have them read that instead of going through the whole schlep of making it yourself. So see what works, see what's best for your students and see what's best for you as a teacher in terms of preparation time and effort. Also, consider your students' learning styles. Um, are they visual? Are they auditory? Um, are they kinesthetic learners? So try to create materials that really cater for all these learning styles so that all students are engaged, so that you're not really isolating anyone in particular, but there's that sense and feeling of inclusion in your classroom. And then again, when creating your own resources, what type of technology is required with the resource. Keep that in mind before you get too excited because of course you might be slightly limited in your classroom or you might have it in your fingertips, whatever you need. Whatever the case, you would need to consider that before creating your materials. And then once again, if online uh, fails, have a backup plan. Technology comes and goes, you need to have a backup plan just in case. Right, so again, with uh, creating your own resources, think about visually uh, what is going on. You know, font type, size, is it clear? Is it simple enough for students to read? I always try to avoid cursive or strange looking fonts. Just keep it simple and clear for them. Also make sure that all students have access, that it's visually suitable, um, you know, with in terms of graphics are they free to use have you created your own and then also the suitability of visuals for example photos for adults rather than cartoons or cute little colorful pictures um keep adult content maybe a little more realistic well with kids yes you can get that bit more creative um like cartoons, for example, or animated pictures. And then also time management. As mentioned earlier, teachers are so busy. I know I am. So if you're going to create some of your own materials, yes, make sure you have the time. A 
at your disposal. And certainly don't start doing it a few minutes before you walk into a lesson. You need time. You need to plan. Because as mentioned earlier, there are quite a few things that you need to consider before creating your own materials. Right. So we're going to have a look at where, where to find teaching resources. And um, yeah, so we've got the TEFL Academy Learning Center posts. We have reputable sites like the British Council. Um, English First is really, really quite rich in content and materials for you to use as a teacher. Then there's ESL Lounge. There's also TED and TED Ed. I'm sure some of you have heard of TED Talks before. Now, TED Talk is a platform where experts talk about anything and everything. And you can filter those videos down to three minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, one hour, dependent on what you're looking for. I will say that TED Talk, um, it's, it's mostly aimed at either first language speakers or proficient or advanced learners. Whereas TED Ed, um, it's not educational in terms of English learning, but it is simplified somewhat. So you are able to use it with slightly lower levels, like your upper intermediate to intermediate students. I still wouldn't chance it with very low levels like A2 or A1. So check, run the script through a vocabulary profiler before you choose and see it, how many above level items there are in the material before deciding whether or not to use it. And then you also have ESL Galaxy is another very useful site. And then Google, Google's your old friend where you can just search for anything and everything. But as mentioned, just a few tips going forward. I have experienced this myself, where you find rookie mistake, where you find an amazing video online. It goes so beautifully with the context it really reinforces the target language that you want to teach. So you think, right, that's it. It's a six minute video. It's perfect. I started listening. It was lovely. It was lovely. I jumped ahead, jumped ahead, jumped ahead, listened to the end. And I thought, right, this is the video for my class. Well, <laughs> when I decided to play the video, I realized that there were quite a few gaps where the sound was inaudible and you couldn't hear what was going on. And then it would it would sound great again, and the sound would be terrible. It would sound great again, and I discovered, oh, you actually have to listen to everything in detail before you play a video for your class. Another thing that I discovered was some bad language. So the video seems okay. You sort of jump through it. The sound is good. It's not a problem. It's beautiful for the context of what you're going to teach, and then. You play it for your students and one or two obscene words are, are said during the video. You didn't check. I didn't check. And I had to apologize to my students. So do listen to the material. If you choose a video, watch everything from start to finish. And if it's text, read everything in detail before giving it to your students. All right. So as you can see, we've covered quite a lot today. I did tell you it was going to be about a 30 minute presentation, but now we've got lots and lots of time to answer your questions, to go over those points that you're not so sure about. And also remember, please, that I will only be answering questions about today's specific topic. If you have any questions that are not related to this topic today, creating your own resources, making your own materials, then you would have to send those questions to tutor support where, as mentioned earlier, our tutors are more than happy to answer. Or if you remember a question later on that you wanted to ask and it is in fact related to today's topic, well, that you can also send to tutor support and we will, of course, assist you ASAP. Right. So now we're going to be, oh, I've got one more slide to go over. I'm so sorry about that. I was talking about the tips that you actually, tips to help you going forward. And I've left out the most important one, proofread your work. When you're about to give, uh, to select a piece of material or give a piece of material to students, proofread it. Why? Because very often these uh, texts are written by bloggers or travelers, if it's a travel piece, 
by chefs if it's a cooking piece, but maybe there are a few mistakes in the text. Now, when you when you choose a piece of material and it's authentic, correcting a couple of the mistakes does not make that text semi-authentic or not authentic. It will still be authentic because you've only corrected a few mistakes or removed a couple of bad words or removed superfluous bits, bits that are not um, necessary. So I would say proofread so that there are no mistakes because what happens if your students see a mistake and it's in a text that you've given them, then they might think that that is correct and it's accurate, right? And then also make sure that the resource that you've created relates to the lesson aims and objectives. Um, does it relate to any kind of assessment, formative or summative assessment? Test the material. And then once you've tested the material, test it again to make sure that it is suitable for your class and for your particular lesson. So right, now it's time for Q&A and you're absolutely welcome now to type your questions in the chat, right? So if you've typed your questions a little bit earlier, I may have missed them because I see the comment section was buzzing today. Lots of comments coming in, lots of interaction, which is great. This is what we always want in these webinars for you to make touch um, and contact with other teachers. But I do need for you to type your questions again then. If you've typed them a lot earlier, I will have missed them. So I would say absolutely please type them right now. All right. So we've actually got a couple of questions already. And the first one relates to the vocabulary profiler. Someone is asking, where can I find a free vocabulary profiler? So I tend to use vocab kitchen um, forward slash profile. So vocab kitchen, let me see if I can type it. I'm not sure if I can type it into, um, into the chat. Not sure if you can see it, but that's the one that I tend to use most of all when planning my lessons or when um, checking my dialogue. You know, what I'm going to say to students, how I'm going to present something. I often use Vocab Kitchen just to check it's free. You don't have to subscribe and you don't get like a temporary access and then start paying. It's 100% free. The site has recently had a bit of a revamp. So if you're not able to um, access via your usual shortcut, maybe you've got a shortcut on your on your computer screen, I would say just remove that one and create a new one because the site is back up and running. Right. Okay, so let's see about some of these questions that have come in. Okay, so Lamise, thank you for your question. When you are presenting online to your students, how does it go about or in terms of showing them visuals? Right, so Lamise, that's a great question because, you know, we tend to think that visuals are just for the face-to-face -face lesson, like they walk in and they can see a picture on your board. But no, I use Zoom, for example. StreamYard is also a great program and you're able to show pictures with their basic functions while you're teaching. I do it all the time. So say for example, um, I'm teaching new vocabulary and I don't want to tell my students the words, I want them to try and guess them, then very often I would show them a picture first um, and it would be share screen, show picture, oh, there's so many little functions you can play around with on these platforms and then they can see the pictures while you're talking to them. They are loads. So for example, Zoom, StreamYard, see what's available, Zoom without having to pay, for example, you can access their 40 minute sessions. And yes, you're able to display images while you're actually speaking to your students. Images, slides, you can show them videos while you're talking to them. There's so much you can do during an online lesson. And thank you for your question. All right, and then Victoria has asked, what would be the best methods to test resources? Victoria, I think in terms of testing resources, it depends on what you're testing. For example, a video, I would say just watch it. Watch the video in detail a, a few times to make sure that the English in the video is accurate, um, that the there are no offensive uh, bits in the video, nothing visually um, untoward in the video. So I would say, you know, it's quite basic. Just run through the material a couple of times. If you find a piece of text, 
read through it carefully. If you find a video, watch it a few times. That is the best way to test resources. If you're wondering about an interactive activity, well, do it yourself. If it's an activity where you've got to click and choose the answers, try it, time it. This is something very, <coughs> excuse me, this is something very important, teachers. When you're choosing activities for your students, right? I find that a lot of teachers um, do not give students enough time to do activities. And the reason is because maybe they've done the activity themselves and the activity took them maybe two minutes to do. But remember, your students are learners of English and it might not take them two minutes. It might take them five, six, eight minutes to do the activity. So do try these activities out and see how long it takes you before giving it to your students. Right. I think someone asked about a vocabulary profiler. I did put it into the chat. Just scroll a little bit further up. If for some reason you can't see it, it's vocabkitchen.com forward slash profile. A very good one. All right. So please remember to type your questions now in the chat. If you have typed your questions a little bit earlier, I might not be able to see them without scrolling through and going through all the um, all the questions. All right, I do see a comment. Um, I think some of you are discussing an assignment. Just remember that assignments are not meant to be discussed on open platforms or open forums among students, as your work must be 100% your own. Yes, of course, you can share ideas, but your work must be 100% different. Um, and we ask students to refrain from discussing the assignments, particularly on open um, forums and open platforms also. But yes, absolutely check where you can access materials. Teacher, there are often sites where teachers load materials and you're able to use them. If you've created, for example, a crossword or a word search, and it's a really nice one, there are sites where you can upload yours and other teachers can actually use them. Because caring is sharing, sharing is caring. All right, so I think we've got a couple more uh, questions that have come through. All right, so I'm going to open this one up to the chat right now. Um, we've got a question. What kind of interactive apps would you like to suggest for young learners? So if any of you know of any great apps that we can use for particularly this question is aimed at young learners, please type it in the, the chat because I'm also always open to learning about these things. So if there are any apps that you've used or that you've come across that are useful, please put them in the chat right now. And by the end of the session together, we might have quite a few nice suggestions that we can actually include in the next webinar. So if you know of any apps, if you've used any apps, if you're still experimenting with a few, put them in the chat right now. Please, I invite you so that we can have our own little resource by the end of this um, webinar. All right, and then yes, please, Put your um, questions in the chat. We have a little bit more time. I'm also just going through some of the questions to see if anything else has come through that I might have missed. And as I'm going through, I'm just seeing that there are so many people from all corners of the globe in our webinar today, and that is absolutely wonderful. All right, so actually a, a few have come in. Starfall for learning phonics, yes. I find that so useful, particularly young learners like the whole interactive element of these apps when it comes to learning sounds. And you can practice things like minimal pairs with them. So quite interesting. Kahoot is a fun resource. Victoria, we use Kahoot quite often. And it's great because yes, you can create your own interactive activities. And um, yeah, I think it's quite simple to use. You just need to subscribe. Do remember that if any of you use Kahoot for our assignments, do send us a few screenshots of your activity and not only the link, because sometimes it would require us to sign in or register in order to view your activities. So send us some screenshots, right? All right. And then we've got BBC Bite Size. 
yeah i've also come across that it's quite useful i think don't they have little listening clips that you can access too if i'm not mistaken it is quite a fun resource yes All right, let's see. So another question has come in um, from Katen. Hi, Luan. If a school hands you a course book and you come across some content that you think would be insensitive to any of your students, can you substitute it or do you need to ask for permission first? My first feeling is just yes, absolutely substitute, replace it with something that you know would not be offensive or um, that they wouldn't feel sensitive about or wouldn't create any kind of awkward feeling in your class, Katen. What I would do is to, I would just okay that with someone at the school, like a director of studies or an academic manager. I would just say, look, I've got, I know this is about the tsunami in this place, but I've got some students in my class that are family members who may have been affected by this. Is it okay if I change things up a little bit so that it doesn't really make anyone feel bad? Or feel uncomfortable absolutely and i think it's a really insightful question katen because you're working with people in your classroom that are that have been exposed to things and are feeling sensitive and are not feeling good about certain things and you know you want your students to walk out there feeling energized and hopeful so i would say great question and my first feeling is yes absolutely take it out replace it with something else as long as the english the English, the target language is covered um, and the context is useful. Yes, you can absolutely tweak and revise. The only thing I would do just to um, make it all clear and transparent is just to tell someone like a manager that I'm going to do this and this is why I'm going to do it. Do I have the okay? And then go for it. Absolutely. Great question. And yes, I think you clarified a little bit later on to substitute the specific item and not the whole book. I totally got you 100%. In fact, the um, the one about the tsunami that I used earlier, I had that experience where um, an area, I was teaching a student who their area was recently impacted by a horrible um, by a tsunami. And then what I did was I thought, you know what, this is maybe a little bit too soon. Um, the student might feel a bit sensitive. I don't know the situation. Maybe some family members or friends had been impacted. So it was a lesson all about natural disasters. And all I did was I swapped two lessons around. I did something else in its place and I saved this one for a little bit later on until I knew more about what the student had personally gone through or whether they had been affected in any way. So absolutely, I hear you. All right, let's see. Oh, um, you know what, Kaysen, just to carry on with your question, because I think you've you've kind of asked an additional question here. How should I handle it if a school is very unaccommodating in that regard? Um, I will say that I haven't come across too many schools that are that way. Um, particularly if these schools are in areas that may have maybe been impacted by something negative. Um, you know, so I would say there are ways around this. You could maybe just take, you know, they're not going to wrap you over the knuckles for maybe just taking something out and replacing it with something else, especially since you've clarified that it's not the whole book that you want to change, but just maybe one item that is not okay. They are usually all right around these things. All right. All right, so let's see. Vivian has asked if you source work through a company, how much extra work do you need to do with uh, regards to resources and their coursework? So Vivian, most, most schools want you to stick to their curriculum. Give or take that you can tweak and, and change things a little bit to make it your own. Or like we were discussing with Kate and earlier, removing bits and pieces that are maybe awkward or uncomfortable for your students. Generally, the coursework that they've given you covers everything. What I tend to do is if I'm working with a curriculum, but I see that my students are lacking in one or two aspects of the unit, I would spend a little bit more time. I would bring in a couple of extra exercises. If the pictures that are in the course book 
are a little bit meh and not that interesting. I would bring in my own, but they would be similar, but they would be more interesting. So absolutely, you can play around with the coursework a little bit. But I would say that usually the coursework covers what the school wants to cover. However, you get to know your students and you get to see what they need a little bit more of, what they need a little bit less of, um, and you take it from there. And you're able to maybe add a couple of exercises or, Vivian, you might even have to cut back a little bit because there is so much to work with. All right. Okay, so um, Modelia from South Africa wants to know um, if you recommend applications such as Duolingo for English beginners to learn basics such as greetings, but in their own time. So I will tell you that, um, you know, they can. They have access to these things and, and lots of them do, but a lot of them also appreciate a lesson on, on um, functions like greeting because there is that back and forth. There is that listening to someone and responding accordingly, having a real person to practice with because that's ultimately what you're going to use that target language for outside. Real people, greeting real people and that kind of interaction. So I would say, yes, they can absolutely practice with those apps. They do anyway. But when it comes to um, th that would not say that you remove that from your syllabus. Absolutely still have that lesson, whether they've prepared a little bit for it, whether they're a bit lacking that's down to them. But still, if you're working with absolute beginners, do include it in your syllabus because that back and forth, that practicing, that interaction, that communication around greeting and introducing yourself is ever so necessary in pairs or in groups. Um, that sort of scenario really, really just boosts that function and solidifies that target language. I'm personally learning French. Just, just for fun, and it's been 29 days now. <laughs> um, it helps with the basic grammar and introductions. You know what I find? That learning another language really makes you understand what your students are going through. So well done to you, 29 days and counting. All right, so we've still got a few of those apps coming through. Um, or let's see, yeah, aims to help. So it's called Fun English Practice. Fun English Practice aims to help young learners familiarize themselves with English, a lot of materials available. So I hope those of you watching the webinar are actually taking notes of these because they're so, so useful um, because the webinar is all about creating your own materials, using materials that are available and tweaking and adapting them to suit your class. So absolutely write these down. Okay, we've got a question from Elena. How often would you recommend to include the authentic materials in the lessons with kids and teens, let's say A2, A2 plus levels? So, Elena, I would probably include authentic materials once a week, um, provided that the coursework that I'm working, the course book or the course content that I'm working with covers the target language. And I would then find a piece of authentic material that goes with the rest of the week's context or the rest of the week's target language. So say, for example, the week is all about food, ordering food in a restaurant, food vocabulary, um, you know, that sort of thing. Maybe I would then find them a little cooking show of, you know, five minutes, um, a famous chef cooking something typical um, of where they live and I would let them watch it and I would let them uh, predict what they think is going to happen what what the chef is making so yeah I would bring that in but it's got to if you choose authentic materials it's got to really relate to the rest of the week or the rest of the day and tie in with what you're doing with them um, coursework um, in terms of course book and coursework so I would say for me personally Elena I bring um authentic materials one tw once, twice a week. But yes, it's got to relate to the content that the coursework is covering for the rest of the week, if that makes sense. If, for example, it's all about transport for the week, maybe I would bring a train ticket or I would bring a set of directions um, to something, bring it into class, and they've got to analyze where we're going for the day. Um, or a timetable 
I would bring in a train timetable and we've got to look at what the English words mean. So that would be authentic materials brought in, um, but would have to, like I said, relate to the rest of the week, if that makes sense. All right, so we've got a question. Dear and close to my heart, what is your ultimate tip for a new teacher to reduce the stress and anxiety with teaching? The struggle is real. I will tell you 100% the struggle is real. But I think, Kate, and what you've got to remember is that what your students want, you've already got. Um, by the time they sit down in front of the computer screen or in your class, you already have exactly what they need. They want to learn English, they want to learn it from you. You've studied, you've prepared, so you've already got what they need. It's like when someone comes to buy a sandwich from you, but you've already got that sandwich prepared. They come to you, they ask you for it, you've got it ready for them. So I know you're, you're going to be a little bit nervous, you might slip up, you might, but remember that students are not fellow teachers. You know, fellow teachers watching you or you, if you get observed at work or if your TEFL instructor is observing you, we're sitting there and we're watching your every move and we're, we're going to give you some feedback afterwards. Your students are far more forgiving. They're there to learn from you. So remember, by the time they sit down, by the time you walk up in front of the class, you already have in your back pocket what they want. I don't know if that helps. I really, really do hope so. It helps me. It really, really helps me. All right, so um, let's see. Oh, and we've got another resource. I'm going to display it on the screen. Grammar Monster, never heard of that before. Sounds great. Grammar Monster has resources and games and tests. I'm absolutely going to check that out because I think anything us teachers can add to our repertoire and to our portfolio of materials is absolutely useful. So thank you, Victoria, for sharing that. All right. I also see you guys have been busy having a fat chat back and forth, but that's wonderful. I'm really, really happy to see that kind of interaction. And I'm really happy that these webinars give you that platform to do so. Really nice ideas shared here. Thank you. And then Victoria has contributed something I find so useful. I have found that being able to, <laughs> I'm laughing as I'm reading it, laugh off a mistake and use it as a teaching moment is essential. And we have so many of those. I have had so many of those teachable moments that I have been the laughing stock. And it's okay because your student, it re immediately diffuses the situation. It shows them that it's okay. When teacher makes a mistake, remember when you're nervous, when you have anxious, when you have anxiety, sorry, you tend to make a couple of mistakes here and there. And with the teacher making a, a mistake, that just shows that you're human and that it's actually an okay space to make mistakes. Of course, yes, we're not going to laugh at each other. Uh, we try to dissuade students from laughing when another student makes a mistake. But, you know, I'm, I'm fair game. So if I make a bit of a mistake and my students have a chuckle, I laugh with them and we move on. So, yeah, you're absolutely right that it very often either creates a nice teachable moment or it just diffuses a little bit of stress and anxiety in the classroom. So thank you for that. I find that so, so useful too. All right, and I think it's Ishtiak. Thank you so much for your kind comment. I really enjoy these webinars with all of you. So um, yeah, thank you for the kind words. We have come to the end of today's webinar and now it's time to go and weekend. I hope you know how to do that. I am going to send you the um, the survey link. It is always useful to hear from you, to hear how you felt during the webinar, if you found anything useful, if you found anything that you'd like to ask us a bit more about, you can absolutely let us know in the survey. And please remember that these webinars, two things you've got to remember is that we will have another one next week same time, same place. Maybe not same place because that's here today, different place, same time, different topic. But also remember, <laughs> laughing at your comments, but also remember that if you miss today's webinar or if you miss a part of today's webinar, um, you can ask us for the link or go onto our YouTube channel 
um, and rewatch them, rewatch them as many times. I watched a couple of them in the week and I had a good laugh at some of the other comments and the, the jokes that tutors were making. Yeah, they're really fun. So do watch them, go over them, watch this one. It'll be available in a few days. And again, thank you very, very much for joining today for all your awesome comments that have come in. Thanks, Lisa Maria. Always lovely to hear from you guys. Okay, so join us next week. I am displaying the survey on the board. And now go and have a fabulous weekend. Bye, guys.